welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. We've got a new name, so you might notice now we're called uh, Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill. Super excited about my guest today. We're going to dive into one of my favorite topics, mold, and especially our brain and mold <laughs> and how that is affected. Um, so I'm excited to introduce our guest in just a moment. Also, I want to just mention if you're out there and you have enjoyed my new book, Unexpected, it's been now out for about six months. We've reached the bestseller status. And I know a lot of you have commented and left me messages. Just really appreciate that. Would love for you to go leave a review on Amazon or Goodreads or wherever you found this book. And please feel free to share with your friends and family, anyone you think might be impacted. Now, one other thing I want to mention, if you bought the book and didn't know that you get a ton of free stuff, go to Read Unexpected, just put in your email and you'll get immediate access to a mass cell lecture I did, my coloring journal, which goes right along with the book. I'll actually show you what that looks like here. Really, really cool. All that for free and um, an audio recording of a hidden chapter. Okay, so without further ado, I want to get on to our special guest today and introduce him. Dr. Martin Hart earned a doctorate degree in chiropractic from Cleveland University, Kansas City, and is trained and studied in a vast array of disciplines, including acupuncture, kinesiology, natural medicine, positive psychology, methylation, detoxification, and many other fields. Dr. Hart understands the healing journey is a partnership between doctor and patient. He takes a personal approach with each patient and uses the most advanced technologies to help release dysfunctional patterns and restore optimal function of the human body. So welcome, Dr. Hart. Thanks for joining me today. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And again, our favorite topic, before we dive into mold and brains and kids and all the good stuff that we got to talk about, I would love to hear a little bit about your journey as far as how you got into chiropractic medicine and what that looked like for you. Yeah. So. Uh, very similar, especially working with moldy kids and moldy brains is uh, as a kiddo, I lived in a basement. A lot of times at a house at the basement flooded every time it rained. Wow. Um, and, you know, we didn't really know how big of an issue that was. But what we did know is I had a lot of issues growing up. So I was diagnosed with various learning disabilities, obsessive compulsive tendencies, uh, sensory processing disorder. I was sick all the time. My mom would say like I was on antibiotics six, seven, eight times a year for uh, strep throat. Yeah. And so, and that progressed into more and more obsessive compulsive tendencies, major anxiety, fatigue, that sort of stuff. So I was at the doctor a lot, but also I was at the chiropractor a lot. I was getting some acupressure. I was getting adjusted. My mom would give me homeopathy right next to the antibiotics. And so I had a weird mix growing up, but what really helped me hone in on kind of making a difference was athletics, right? I, I loved playing athletics. For me, it so it gave me something to focus on with my obsessive compulsiveness, my anxiety. It gave me a focus. It gave me a drive. My dad was big into like sports nutrition and working out, so that helped. He he helped me with that, and so I started taking supplements, which I noticed as a teenager and, and young, maybe like middle schooler. They're like, hey, when I take these, other things feel better, mm -hmm. and so that got me on that track. And uh, I decided to do chiropractic. And uh, at first, being in chiropractic school, I didn't like it because. Um, I thought I wanted to do sports medicine and I was like, these guys are talking about all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, I, you can help the human body by doing this stuff and whatever. And I was like, no, no, I'm out. And so I was trying to transfer to PT school and my wife threw her back out. And this is while I was still in school. And usually I could do a little bit of hands-on adjustment work and she would feel better. And it didn't work that time. And, uh, so at that time she was running an in-home daycare. So I stayed home with the kids. Uh, while I was treating her on the table. We couldn't afford to take her to the ER. And so I was having to carry her around the house. I was having to help her with everything. Finally, I called one of the mentors who was teaching me kinesiology and some Chinese medicine and a little bit of herbalism. I went to a class of his and I said, I'm going to give this 30 days and try it. And so I called him. I said, hey, look, I know you just met me last weekend. Here's what's happened with my wife. What do I need to do? He said, you just need to work these two reflex points to clear the spine of some toxicity and balance it back out with some torque that's on it. I did that. She could walk. And mm. she's like, this is what you're doing. <laughs> she's like, this is, you're, uh, get, we got to get rid of the PT stuff. Gotta get, and so I dove in with two feet, started learning more herbalism, started learning more homeopathy, functional medicine, those sort of things, and haven't looked back since. Wow. I love how our, our journey, our childhood, our, our relationships shape 
our practice in so many of my journeys. It's similar because growing up on a farm, I grew up in Midwestern Illinois and uh, all of those experiences shaped. I had so bad allergies, so many antibiotics, like you said. And it's interesting. One thing I love about chiropractors and talking to you and others like you is I grew up with my primary doctor, basically a chiropractor. That was the main source. So I mean, we still visit doctor or whatever, but I had a great respect and I always wanted to be a chiropractor. And it's funny because he kind of steered me into medicine. He's like, no, Jadel, you actually could be someone who could change the system. And there's, you know, thank goodness now it's, things are more level playing field because back in the day, I think he had experienced a lot of the um, discrimination, right? You know how that goes. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to call out like I have the deepest respect because <laughs> that's where I was headed. And I'm like, I, I feel like there's such a power. And I saw as a child growing up, that's, you know, who helped me get well when I was sick. So I, I love that. Yeah, I love that too. So how did you get into more the, uh, um, our topic today is moldy kids, moldy brains, and we see how mold really, really does affect the brain. Let's maybe frame this as far as, um, what kind of people are you seeing, especially children coming in? What are their symptoms and what leads you to think about mold as a cause? Yeah. So, uh, we do see a lot of pediatrics. We do, we see families and adults as well, but, uh, we see a lot of pediatrics coming in. A lot of times they have, um, maybe it's really basic, like asthma or, or chronic. I've got one patient right now. She gets strep throat once a month in school. Mm-hmm. We tested the school. The school was moldy. It was, it was mold you know, suppressing your immune system. So it's, it could be like chronic infections are a biggie, but then it gets really worse where it's the chronic sinus infections, chronic respiratory infections, strep throat, maybe it's progressing into major histamine intolerance. So allergies all the times, so the redness, rashes, nosebleeds are a big one. And it could be even as it gets to the brain, we might see those pans pandas cases, right? So we think about strep and those are maybe Lyme or mycoplasma getting to the brain, creating obsessive compulsive tendencies, rage, uh, hysteria, trouble sleeping, right? Food intolerances, sensory processing issues at that point, motor tics. And so we think of strep and infections and that's true, but what's allowing those to get in there? What's allowing those to cross that blood brain barrier? A lot of times mold was suppressing their immune system. And so and ramping up their inflammation, which allowed that to happen. So I see that a lot in our pediatric cases. They're throwing more tantrums than maybe their siblings or their peers, regardless of parenting style. You know, they're more irritable. They've got more food aversions, food intolerances, a lot of digestive issues. Those are pretty chronic ones I see. And for me, especially in pediatrics, chronic nosebleeds, hands down, I'm looking at mold probably 99% of the time. Yeah. So let me repeat that. That's so important. Chronic nosebleeds. Um, we know medically there's this von Willebrand factor that can be affected by the mold and it can literally cause you to not clot as well. So nosebleeds, I remember years ago, Dr. Shoemaker, who did some of the mold research in the beginning, um, would talk about, you know, uh, the people would come in and they'd had just smelled the paper that was moldy and they'd get a nose yeah. or like he'd get papers from a moldy patient or house, like intake papers. And then so that's very, very uh, real. So these parents yeah. are obviously concerned about this. And and the big thing I love that you mentioned is schools. Sadly, so many public buildings, schools, courthouses, and things are really deeply affected by mold. And I think that it's way bigger than we think. What percentage of, I mean, sometimes when you're in an area, you only know maybe certain school systems. But I know for me here, I see a lot of systems that where the kids are chronically ill in the same schools. How often do you think that's an actual root cause is these kids are in a school that's moldy? Yeah, I would say it's probably 80 to 90%, at least based on the population I see. And sometimes I'll have them, sometimes the school administration's good about testing it. And sometimes I have them sneak in a test and test it. And it's it's 85 to 90% of the time I have them test the school. It's coming back with toxic mold. And uh, that's usually using the ERMI test or maybe sometimes an EMA test. And so it's we know it's uh, it's a straightforward test. So I guess, yeah, the school's moldy. And at this point, you know, from my experience with patients, at least, my theory with like, oh, kids go to school and they start getting more viruses and back to, no, those, that's not because the kids are passing it around. In my experience, it's because those schools are moldy and so their immune system suppressed. Yeah. So let's talk briefly about what would you tell a parent? Because maybe parents are listening. You're like, oh my gosh, I think maybe my kids, since they've been in this grade, in this classroom, in this school, there's been bigger behavioral or, or illness issues. What would you, t- t- you mentioned Ermi and Emma, real familiar with those. But for those who are listening, tell us a little bit about what you would tell a patient uh, or the parent to actually do for testing. Yeah, so we can test, you know, you can test the environment. And so that's an Ermi, which stands for Environmental Relative Moldy Index. It's an EPA designed test. So it's a dust test. You can go and dust in the area to see um, what's the environment like. 
And there's other testing you can do mycotoxins and things, but then on the patient, for sure, we would do a urine mycotoxin test. I want to see if that patient's holding urine toxins. And we might adjust that test depending on their detox pathways, maybe a glutathione challenge first or a sauna or exercise first. But we want to see, is that little guy or little gal holding toxins in their system? And a urine is a great way to do it with kids. You can do a urine catch. You can even do, some of these com- companies now do um, diaper catches. Mm-hmm. So I've had some of my toddlers do my urine mycotoxin test via a diaper catch and see what's coming out. And it's really sad to see some of these young students kindergarten, first, second grade be loaded with mycotoxins when you measure those. Yeah. I love that you mentioned that because that's really what you want to do. And I often do like the Emma or Ermi and then actually look at the patient and say, does this match? Now it's yeah. okay. It doesn't match because there's very frequently an order of operations. I'd love to know if you've seen this, but like, for example, say you're in a moldy home, you get out and you start excreting and detoxifying. I find that patients t- tend to excrete the aflatoxins and ochre toxins and the things from penicillin aspergillus first. And then yeah. later, it might be six months later till they excrete the trichosithines, the really nasty nasty toxins. Um, yeah. I, do you see that as well? Yeah, it's pretty similar. I say the aspergillus type mm-hmm. uh, mycotoxins are coming out early. Mm-hmm. Later ones might be like those black mold, trichothecenes, or even some of the citronines. Mm-hmm. Those are going to come out later. And so it's it's not uncommon to see them shift a bit. And uh, you know, it's not alarming when that happens because yeah. it's usually like you're saying, it's that body going, okay, yeah. I can do this first, then this second. And even family members in the same environment, you know, one kid's in school and the other kids are at home and they can definitely have a variety of excretion and it doesn't sway me from the fact that they all have some exposure. So I love that we're talking about this because I think it can be confusing. I've had a lot of patients say, well, this doesn't match exactly. And and sometimes it does match exactly. And then you're like, okay, we're bingo, right? But it doesn't yeah. always because there's so many varieties. And then when you're doing urinary mycotoxins, you're really measuring excretion, which is what we want. So it's not always bad. Do you find that if you, do you retest them in four to six months or do you just watch them? Because sometimes you can see them, those levels go up and that can also be confusing for patients. Yeah. Usually at this point, I've waited a little longer, like that six month yeah. mark, just because some, for some of those, it takes 90 days to have a full excretion effect anyways, but I don't want to freak them out when yeah. they, because for a little while, you know, if you're not detoxing and you're in the environment, you might be excreting some, mm-hmm. and then we start detoxifying, you pull you out of the environment. Like we're saying, you start dumping more and they're going to be really alarmed no matter what I'm telling them uh, that their levels are going up. And so, but if we wait that full six months, you'll get the better effect without alarming everyone. And so you don't have to go through that scary cycle, but exactly. Yeah. We'll retest in six months and we'll do some other tests in between. Like I'll do pretty frequently the VCS test, a visual contrast screen, which is an online visual test that helps us monitor neurotoxins. And we can see that one go down really nicely as, as mycotoxin and neurotoxin loads go down. Thank you for explaining that because I think that's so key for patients to understand and I do the exact same thing. So I really, really appreciate that you explained. So say we have a kiddo, you know, seventh or eighth grade or, you know, third or fourth grade, you name it an age and you found out they likely have mycotoxins. Um, You might find they have the frequent strep. Let's just talk through a case. Like how would you approach that? Because you've got all these tools, you've got the chiropractic, you've got the herbs, you've got the, what's your approach to a kiddo like that that's having symptoms, maybe aggression, rage, and we have known mold and maybe even known infections. Yeah. So uh, initially what I'm doing is kind of what we call triage, right? So um, we're going to do two steps at the same time, which step one is try to modulate the environment. Can I get them out of the environment? Can I improve the environment at all? And then kind of step two, but almost happening at the same time is, can I lower inflammation while starting to bind up some of the toxins? So what can I do? Because those those behavioral changes really most of the time are a sign of neuroinflammation, right? Mm -hmm. So those outbreaks, those rages, their brain's being overloaded. It's getting excitotoxic and, and neurotoxic at that moment. So it's creating inflammation. So if we can lower that inflammation a bit, calm that fire down while taking away the gasoline, the mold exposure, we can make a big change early. And so we're saying, okay, what things can we do to modulate inflammation? Does it look like a low histamine diet? Does it look like natural or pharmaceutical antihistamines? Does it look like, you know, high dose fish oil, or maybe something like a quercetin or resveratrol to stabilize that. And then at the same time, can we bind up some of those mycotoxins with a gentle binder that keeps them, keeps them balanced out. And that way that we start there and then we start to cycle down, maybe detox, deeper detox cycles, hormone imbalance if they have them. Yeah. Let's talk binders and kiddos, because I feel like that's a little, I'd love to know what your preference is. Um, you don't have to name specific brands. You can, if you want, but what are the, some of the kind of uh, substances that you prefer when you're treating kids, uh, let's say under the age of eight? 
Yeah. So younger pediatric cases like that, um, humic and fulvic acid in a powder form seems to go really well. It's, it's very mild tasting. You can take it with food, right? It's, it's a good broad spectrum, a mycotoxin binder, a good source of minerals. Uh, a lot of times you can mix it in a little bit of juice and they don't seem to notice, especially a good trick with, um, some of these things that are tasteless, but have a, cause it has a really black, deep color mm -hmm. is put it in a bottle that you can't see through. And then they hardly look at it or make it a joke, right? Like my mom really saved me, I think as a kid, because I had so much food aversion that she had me convinced that this greens powder I took was Ninja Turtle slime. She had me convinced it was Ninja Turtle slime. I would have my friends taking it, you know, because they come over, you got to get some of this slime. And so make it a game with the kiddos, but humic and fulvic uh, acids mm -hmm. in a powder form is so gentle. You can go low or high because it's in powdered and then you can't hardly taste it. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith, is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme, or Epstein-Barr, and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. I can't hardly taste it. I love that. I couldn't agree more because that fulvic acid just dries the minerals into the cells. So you're kind of getting this nourishing um, effect yeah. and they rarely cause constipation. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's usually doesn't affect the bowels, which can be an issue. Um, so you have this kiddo, you're treating inflammation. Is there any particular herbs or things that you go for with brain inflammation? Like where would you start with, with um, again, a kiddo that has brain inflammation in the inflammatory pathways? Yeah. So um, if depending on their challenges, I really love quercetin. Mm -hmm. uh, and I use a lot of skull cap. Mm -hmm. So skull cap is going to be, you know, an herbalism, we call it a nervine. So it's going to be uh, neuro calming, right? Supporting the nervous system, calming the nervous system, acts on the GABA receptors. So it, it can calm pain, it can calm uh, inflammation, uh, and it can calm the nerves down. But also it's highly anti-inflammatory. It really shuts down that cytokine cascade that's happening. That's overactive in that moment for them. And then as a fun, a fun side effect, it's very mildly antimicrobial. So it hits a little bacteria, it hits a little viruses, but that, that combination of anti-inflammatory and neuro calming, I love skull cap hands down is probably my favorite. Mm, gosh, I agree with you. It's two of my favorites. Um, and then of course, and of course has anti-mast cell, anti-histamine, like you mentioned, so important. Um, so what about a school environment? You know, that to me is always tricky because most of the time we can't take them out of school. Is there any yeah. tips or tricks or things that you've done where you really know the classroom's an issue or their gym or their, you know, some exposure that may be really difficult for the patients and family to avoid? What do you do in that situation? Yeah. So two sides of it. One side is like, what can we do proactive? And so I'll say, you know, I'm like, let's, let's talk to the school as a, what can we do about this together set up? Not not accusatory because that'll get them on the wrong side, but especially go to the teacher first okay, and say, Hey, we've got this issue. We know it's here. What would you feel about me buying an air filter to put in the classroom? Mm -hmm. You know, would you, would I'll pay for it? You know, would that be okay with you? And a lot of times they're going to say, sure. Right. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even, um, would you mind if I left this antifungal solution that you can mist around the room occasionally? You know, would you, would that be okay with you? I have even some parents who come in and they, the teachers will let them fog the classroom once a month. And so they'll do that. They'll go in and fog. So that's kind of like a proactive mm -hmm. steps you can take. And then on the flip side is what I'll have them do is, um, binders as soon as they, before they get to school, have them do binders in their lunch, have the school nurse, give them binders at lunchtime and then binders as soon as they get back home. So that we're kind of surrounding in Chinese medicine, we would call it surrounding the dragon but yeah. we're kind of surrounding the issue with those binders. So they're catching whatever's coming in. And then the same thing, nasal spray. We're going to do a, a custom blended nasal spray with probably some silver and maybe a little bit of some homeopathic extracts and then maybe some essential oils in there so that they're getting it before and after. So you're clearing as much of that fungal and mold spores that got out of there as we can, really trying to uh, batten down 
the intake of those mold spores and the mycotoxins. Okay. I love where you're going with all these uh, lines of thinking, because <clears throat> this is our cavity that we inhale. It goes right into the lungs, into the bloodstream and also closest to the brain, right? Um, mm, yeah. so let's talk specifics again about kiddos. Cause let's talk like under eight and then let's talk like over eight because kiddos can be a little hard to get a nasal spray or rinse or whatever. What are you specifically yeah. doing with them um, with like a nasal treatment? And then maybe before we go there, tell about like, why is this such an important cavity for the brain and for your kids in treating that? Cause I agree. Oh yeah. Me. Yeah. So the sinuses, you know, we think of smell, right. As so we think of nose and sinuses, so that olfactory nerve, that's one of your cranial nerves. So it's, it's a nerve that it does smell for us. It goes right into the brain and then it goes right next to our hippocampus, our limbic system. So it's going to gauge emotional regulation, threat response, fight or flight. What a lot of people don't know is that when you're smelling something, okay, that means a part of that molecule, whatever you're smelling is actually touching part of that nerve. That's how that transmission works. So it sounds really terrible if you're heading into a bathroom and you smell what you're smelling, but that means a little bit of that is actually touching nerves and part of your brain. And so when that mold is getting into our sinuses, it's going right through, it can, it can get through a little part of the plate that's up there into the olfactory nerve and actually start to directly affect the brain. And then when those areas get inflamed, that inflammation is hitting right next to that limbic system. And so it's going right to that fight or flight response, right to that rage and emotional center that happens there. So that's a biggie. And then this area gets colonized. A lot of times you get colonized with both mold and fungus or even one called Marcons. It's a antibiotic resistant staph bacteria that happens in there with a lot of mold cases and chronic inflammatory cases. And so that constantly not only drips down in the system, creates inflammation, but it's directly impacting that brain factor right away for neuroinflammation. And not to mention, we talked a little about the nosebleeds and we talked about that can be, but some of these nosebleeds are scary. They're outright hemorrhages where uh, I've had some cases of my pediatric patients when they, they weren't quite grasping how important it was to stay away from the exposure. And they had, we had to send them to ER because they're having such bad blood loss. And so it's, it can be major. And so that can be another factor there. Um, but some of my pediatric cases who can't do the nasal sprays, sometimes, you know, once, if I can get them kind of relaxed and used to in the office, then mom and dad can do it back home. But if they can't, we'll nebulize. Perfect. We'll nebulize at that point. They can just wear the mask. They can do maybe a little bit of silver, sometimes hydrogen peroxide or iodine because it's an antifungal capacity or maybe a little bit of oil, essential oils. But silver for sure is pretty gentle and easy. They tolerate that really well. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. I love it. So, so practical. Um, and so obviously the older ones, are you compounding? Are you creating these in your um, practice? Are you purchasing them from a third party? Uh, Cause I love the combination you mentioned herbal silver and, and some of those things. Um, what's the best way can patients get this on their own? <laughs> yeah. So we do custom compound them. Like we'll do, if we're in the office, yep. we'll do some various frequency and muscle testing and custom compound, but really, you know, you can do some basics. So we always use a nanoparticle silver, like 90% of the time is our base is a nanoparticle silver. Um, pretty often for like an antifungal component, you can get a high, high purity organic, like rosemary essential oil is very anti-fungal. Uh, um, eucalyptus globulus goes great as a mucolytic. So it breaks down that mucus, opens up the sinuses. It's mildly anti-everything. So antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial. Those, those two right there, I find are very gentle with that silver. Uh, and the nanoparticle silver, you know, everybody's afraid it'll turn you blue. It won't turn you blue when it's nanoparticle. We can process that out really well. And so I find those three, you can blend those up pretty easily yourself. And it's very gentle and easy to do. Just a few drops of silver. I mean, a few drops of oils per like two ounces of silver is, goes a long way. And I'll, you know, I'll get a little farther where I'll do some anti-inflammatory oils. I'll do some very strong antimicrobials. But I tend to, I would say if you're trying to stick to really gentle and I want to try this on my own, Rosemary and eucalyptus tend to go really well. Oh, this is wonderful, wonderful information. And um, interesting on the silver, I agree. It's really if people are taking large, large oral oral, oral doses mm -hmm. that have that issue. So I've never seen the, the nasal and I use that all the time too. In fact, we at ICI, the group that does a lot of the mold, you know, doctors and stuff yeah. have really moved from any of the bacterial sprays like BEG to almost exclusively high dose silver with EDTA yeah. or combinations. Now, interesting, you mentioned rosemary because I've always known 
as a breast cancer survivor, Rosemary is so powerful anti-cancer effects. And I just put out an article about a week or so ago that's about, gotten a ton of traction on the connection between candida and cancer because they found mm. it the cancer cells, these yeast issues. I don't think that everyone who has cancer has candida, but I think there are some cases. And Rosemary being anti-fungal, anti-mold, that just thought as you were talking made me wonder, you know, because if it's anti-mold and it's anti-cancer, could there be a connection with it being anti-fungal in nature and the anti-cancer effects? Who knows? I'm just postulating in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, yeah. It's very interesting. It's, <laughs> it's interesting to think about even on that front of like, you know, metabolically, the way the cancer cell works and a way a candida cell works is very similar. That sugar hungry, starch hungry setup. Uh, yeah, it would make a lot of sense. I like that thinking. Just uh, off the cuff here. <laughs> But I love it. Um, so uh, let's talk about the, um, so we got, you got the kiddos and we talked about yeah. that. And obviously the parents are involved in treatment wise for say, again, maybe seven or eight year old, would you be going for four to six months? What's your typical time frame? Yeah, that's pretty standard at that front. And they, you know, kids respond so well. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times within, you know, a couple of days to the first couple of weeks, they're seeing huge benefit, especially yeah. if we can make outside like lifestyle changes to like mold avoidance or like reducing some of the mold, or at least the parents are willing to implement the pre, during and post school protocols. Yes. They make really good. It's that four to six months is, is pretty good. Um, if there's not any crazy external similar circumstances, they do really well in that time frame. And that made me think about, you know, if someone's doing really well and all of a sudden they regress, do you usually assume it's a new exposure? Is that the typical place that you go? Because yeah, especially any of my kids, like my pants, pandas kids, or like maybe my more like neurodivergent kiddos. Um, the two big things I'm going, okay, where was the mold exposure or what's the new stressor that's been introduced in their life? Oh, good for you. I love saying that because it is, you know, you have the stability and then so often they regress at some point. And um, let's go on to the infection and more the pan pandas. First of all, frame this. Now, if you guys have been listening here, you heard my interview recently with Dr. Jill Christo. We talked about this, but I think it's so important. And again, from the feedback that we got, there's a lot of parents out there that are dealing with these. And it, what's funny, what's really sad to me is there's so many children now on psychiatric meds. Now, certainly it may be appropriate. I don't have any problem with the right usage in a dire situation, but the problem is so often it's not root cause as you and I know. Um, yeah. so let's talk about how do these infections and what really, what is pan and pandas and how do the infections play into this? And you already framed it as the mold can weaken the immune system, but let's talk more about that infection link to the brain. Oh yeah. So pan's pandas, it's that pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndrome, right? So it's one is associated with strep and the other is associated with other infections, but it's essentially when that the infections get to the brain, creating neuroinflammation. A lot of these kids end up with obsessive compulsive tendencies, major anxiety, um, like neurodevelopmental regression. Uh, and so there's major, oftentimes a histamine component. So a lot of food allergies, a lot of seasonal allergies, skin issues involved for them, motor tics, et cetera. And so what happens in my experience is they maybe have these infections. A lot of these kids get their tonsils taken out because the strep hides there. They've got chronic viruses that show up. They've got a lot of times mycoplasma. Less often I see Lyme causing it, but it is a prevalent. I would say the two microbes I see the most often are strep and mycoplasma mm -hmm. uh, when I run these kids' lab panels. But um, I have not personally seen a pans pandas case who didn't have mold at the root. Uh, and so when I run their mycotoxin test, when I take a really detailed history, it started with prolonged mold exposure, uh, which in of itself is going to create neuroinflammation, but really it's going to suppress that immune system. And now these bugs, which we have strep, we all have strep in our colon, right? We have small amounts of strep mm -hmm. in our system. We all have, um, probably lots of us have some exposure to mycoplasma, which is a, a very tiny bacteria that's associated with Lyme often, but it can be by itself. But suddenly we can't fight them back anymore because of that mold exposure and we just explode with these infections, they hit the brain at that point, and boom, that's that neuroinflammatory cascade. That's when we find that um, the obsessive compulsive tendencies take over. And a lot of these parents, what they tell you is he, he or she was okay, and then got sick, and then suddenly wasn't the same after, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, that's when we really suspect pans pandas, but it's, in my experience, the infections are present, and, in, and dealing with the infections is vital. It's important. But really, we have to look at what allowed the infections to get out of control in the first place. And I would say, you know, I'm not an absolutist, so I'll say 99%. But 99% of the cases I see their pants, pandas has mold at the root. 
I love that you've said that because I would agree. And I see a lot more adults than kids, but I see kids as well. And so often I see the Lyme or I see the mycoplasma or I see these other things that are playing into it or even heavy metals. And what happens with mold is not only does it massively weaken the immune system, it trashes your detox system. So because yeah. of that, what I, I really, really like your train of thinking because I think that um, a lot of docs are doing really heavy antimicrobials initially. And maybe that patient wouldn't have to have that if we could restore their immunity. And it sounds like that's exactly the direction you're going. And I have found in my practice too, over and over and over again, I keep thinking, gosh, not everybody has mold, right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. it just is so often, shockingly, it's like you you find it again. And I, I remember the very beginning after my experience, I was like, gosh, I want to be objective. So I'm not going to assume that just because I had this experience that every patient I see has this, but yeah. over and over and over, I still would say, like you said, it's not one hundred percent. But there's so frequently, and I know now the patterns just probably like you do. The signs yeah. and the things they moved or they changed locations or there was water damage and things changed. And as I see that, I'm once again, like, okay, here we go again. It's mold. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know, what's important to recognize too, is that it's not just that so many of the cases that we would see that maybe are complicated to have mold. It's the fact that mold illness is becoming more prevalent because of the way we design buildings. Mm -hmm. We've set buildings up now that they're, they're mold havens. We've got indoor plumbing, we've got air conditioning, right? We've got humid environments. We've got drywall, which is essentially mold food, mm -hmm. right? And so we've created all these and we're, the more energy efficient your house is, the more it's a better environment that it creates a better environment for that mold to grow. And so we've actually created over time, moldier and moldier setups that allow for more of it. And then we've got poor education in the uh, contractor world and even in the mold remediation world, just to be frank, most mold remediators, the poor guys and gals don't know what they're doing when it comes to a patient who's got chronic inflammatory response syndrome or mold illness or biotoxin illness, because they weren't trained, the education isn't there for them. And so, you know, they might tell you the house is clean. We retested it's, it's dirty. You know, you've got, they might tell you they vacuumed up and shop backed up the water. That's not good enough. And mm -hmm. so we're creating this bigger environment where more and more people are getting mold toxic because it is more prevalent because of the way we build houses and, and manage buildings now. I, all these ways that all these important facts that you're sharing are so important because people don't realize. And I think COVID actually brought this to a head in some ways, because all of a sudden there's moldy home, but they're going to work every day for eight hours. And people were more home and more present in these environments that maybe weren't so good for them. I just yeah. to me in, in this area where I'm living, there's a ton of construction and there's all these real fast, like multifamily homes and condos and things going up. And I drive by every day. And for a while in uh, this summer for Colorado is the rainiest and most wet month of like May, June and July. And I would see pouring down rain and no roofs, and no constraint, you know, just this beams. And they say, oh, the wood is treated. But my thought is like, oh my gosh, those things are all, every one of them that I saw as I walked, you know, drove by every day. I was like, there is no way that that wood isn't getting saturated and those materials that should be indoors aren't getting seeded. And then again, yeah. it might not actually be growing mold now, but the first time they get water leakage or humidity or issues, that wood that's in the houses that just got totally soaked is going to be a nidus. And again, you and I see this all the time, but is I think the the quickness of construction, the materials, and then even like you said, even these like LEED certified, really, really efficient buildings, they're not letting air exchange. And I always say I'd much rather be in a hundred year old log cabin with some holes in the walls where there's airflow, right? Than to be in a, uh, you know, New York city lead certified building. And I've seen yeah. the stories like you have, I'm sure of these buildings that are really, really beautiful multi-million dollar homes and they are full of mold. <laughs> oh yes. It's so sad. We, I just had a case. It was like that her home was beautiful. Yeah. And I think she's $250,000 into her mediation right now. And I'm going, we maybe should have a conversation earlier in this process about yes. how much to invest in it, but it's uh, it's sad because it's it's exactly right. It's their mold traps. Yeah. yeah. Do you see again? We're we're doctors. We're not environmental mediators or politicians or anything. But as we're on this topic, I think it's so important. I don't have all the answers, but I'd love to know. Do you see any way that we can, whether it's patients listening, up you who are care about this or have you know illness in their family, or you or I, that we can actually make any changes? Because I feel like it's overwhelming at times, and uh, I don't really know the answer. Yeah, I think sometimes it's okay to say we don't know yet, but let's create more awareness publicly as best we can. I think is as uh, we raise awareness um, publicly in, in public forums uh, and political forums to say like, hey, this is a big issue. And uh, I think as practitioners for us, 
is being willing, which is scary, right? Because you're putting your livelihood on the line sometimes, but is being willing to say, no, let me write this letter to this institutional director. Let me write this letter to this local congressman about wet buildings. Let me let me talk to the school superintendent about wet building syndrome, about mold illness and chronic inflammatory response and how dangerous it is to the kids. Um, get the permission from the parents to show them this child's labs, to show them how this is affected. And so they can start to decide at least for themselves, because I think sometimes when you put a moral onus on them that says, yeah, you can ignore this because of the budget, but at the same time too, I just need you to understand that what you're by ignoring this, you're creating this illness for this child. Here is it on paper. I just need you to understand that by if you if you don't at least create some awareness for yourself and take some action in the right direction, that that's, that's kind of on you. And so when I think you create that moral onus and you create that awareness, you're going to start to see at least grassroots changes in the right direction. Thanks for sharing, because I think that is so important. I'm like a very apolitical person. I don't get involved in politics. But with these kinds of issues, I felt more and more like I must because we have the medical knowledge to say this is actually really, really dangerous to our future generations. And you know, even in political buildings and courthouses, it's an issue. So maybe our oh, yeah. and our, you know, all of that. So I love that you share that because I think what we can do is write letters. I've had a lot of patients ask me to appear in court. There's been a few cases where I have to, you know, testify. That's not yeah. something I do on a routine basis. But when I have, it's been very important just because I think those are the little wins that we can get that hopefully, because right now the legal system is very much weighted against um, homeowners or renters or school children or any of these groups, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's, it is. It's a big, it's a, it's, it's momentum, but we're heading in the right direction, I think, slowly. Yeah. Good. Um, what last bits of, of wisdom would you want to give to parents out there who are dealing with this? Because I think the one thing that um, you alluded to and is so important, but that we maybe didn't talk about outright is these kiddos can be so sick and so uh, whether it's anger, aggression, or it can be really, really hard in families. And you and I know what's going on in the kid's brain. So there's nothing but compassion for those behavioral outbursts and the kinds of things that are really almost difficult to handle in a family. But I mean, it can get violent. I've seen parents who've had fractures and things from their children. Of course, how in the world? I just want to speak to those parents out there because I think this is one of those things that's there's so much shame around it, right? You love your child. You want so much for the good for them. But when they have pain or pain, or brain inflammation, they can really act out. The behavioral disturbance can be really difficult to deal with. And of course, we're helping the kiddos, but any thoughts to the parents that are dealing with this? Because it's hard. Yeah, I would say um, as best you can, make sure you look out for yourself. Mm -hmm. Take whatever little moments of self-care you can, because you know, if you've been through it, that you have to muster all the energy, the mental, physical, and spiritual energy you can to work with some of these kiddos when they're at their worst, because it's difficult. Like you're saying, they can get violent. They can get ragey. Um, Don't take it personal because they will pull out all sorts of stuff that you don't know why they've even heard these things they say sometimes (laughs) from. So you can't take it personal when they're they're lashing out at you um, on that front. And don't give up hope. Don't give up looking. Um, And I think even for myself of like looking back and um, I maybe wasn't as extreme as some of my cases I have that get like that, but recognizing that the moment they're in now even though it's 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 hard and it's difficult and sometimes scary, it can become a strength for them later, right? It's going to be an experience they can pull from. So don't give up hope. Keep looking for answers uh, and and ask for help. Most importantly, so sometimes I've had um, families who are in here and the parents they know I'm a practitioner, so they're in here getting help kind of for like the functional medicine of their kiddo, but they're not asking for help of Do you have resources for us for counseling? Do you have resources for us of how do I help him behaviorally? How do I approach this? Because sometimes if you don't ask for help, we as practitioners might get caught up in the doing, doing, doing of the setup. But um, I try to make sure we're offering like, hey, here's some support groups online or in person you can look at that are helpful. Reach out to these folks. They're helpful to be around people who maybe aren't used to neurodivergent kids or kids dealing with these infections or these toxicities. So find other families you can connect with because, you know, the, the typical mom and dad at school, they may have no idea what you're going through. They don't know why your kid's acting out. They may have no understanding of giving you grace. They may offer advice to you that's terrible for your situation. So find like-minded individuals, reach out, ask for help, and don't give up. 
Oh my goodness. That is worth its weight in gold. <laughs> it's so important. Um, last bit here is say if mom or dad is listening and their kid had, you know, they think they maybe have mold or they're dealing with that. What are, what's like a one, two, three really practical tips where they might be able to start either if they don't have a practitioner to get some treatment or do some things that they could do at home that's safe. Where would be the starting point with either themselves or a child and the treatment? Yeah. I would say what's typically pretty uh, helpful is doing some natural antihistamines, whether that's a little bit of quercetin or a little bit of vitamin C even goes, is tends to be okay. You know, vitamin C could be iffy with oxalates, but tends, most kids tend to do well with that. Uh, a very gentle binder, like the humic and fulvic acid um, goes really, really well in that. And then something to calm the nervous system. And if you want to go really gentle, we would just start with maybe some magnesium. So I'd say looking at something for inflammation, maybe like a little bit of quercetin, looking for something to help bind up some of the mold. So maybe a humic and folic acid, something to calm the nervous system, maybe a little magnesium. Ah, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, Dr. Hart, it has been such a ple pleasure getting to know you and hearing your take and it's so aligned with what I'm doing. And it's nice to know as soon as you, even as a practitioner, you feel kind of alone and uh, what great work you're doing and what an important thing for these kiddos. Um, are you obviously still taking patients and tell us a little bit about where we can find you. <laughs> Yeah. So we're just South of Nashville, Tennessee. We do take new patients. There's myself and another practitioner in the office with us, another clinician who does the exact same work I do. So we, we do take uh, new patients, pediatrics, families, adults on that front. Uh, practice name is Keystone Total Health. Uh, yeah. We're happy to take new patients virtually and in person. Wonderful. And where's your website? Yeah. KeystoneTotalHealth.com. And then you can find us on Instagram and Facebook under the same. Awesome. We will link up wherever you are found on this episode. Thank you again for your time today. It was great chatting with you, Dr. Joe. Thank you. You too.